Hello. Welcome. I'm Sister Mary McLone from Crandallette, and this is part two of our, I suppose we could say, windows on our history, talking about the history of the Sisters of St. Joseph in the United States. I'm doing this because I'm currently involved in writing a book for the Federation about the history of the Sisters of St. Joseph in the United States. Uh, this is really kind of a preview of what will come what will come will be more organized than today's presentation. Uh, but here we're going to talk today about 1850 and beyond. One of the things that we're going to see is the huge influence that France had on the growth of the church in the United States. And we can look at the next slide here. For us, these arrows are pointing to fairly important places. Down here is Le Puy. Here is Lyon. Over here in front of the blue arrow is Saint Etienne. And down the yellow is Chambry. And that would be the same general area of Moutier as well. Up here is the port of Le Havre. And as you can imagine, that was quite a trek for all of those sisters who came from this area to get on a ship to come to, the, to America, whichever part of America they were coming to. But when we look at France, we have to remember how much they really gave the church in the United States. Many of our bishops, many of our early bishops were French. Uh, many of our others, priests and bishops, were educated in France. The, the, the very fact of deaf education got started in France, in Paris, with a, a French priest. And our, our sisters learned in Saint-Étienne about teaching the deaf. So France had an awful lot to do. The Society for the Propagation of the Faith underwrote a tremendous amount of development for seminaries, parishes, churches, etc. French religious communities and among them, I think probably predominantly Sisters of St. Joseph, have, have offered a great amount to the church in the United States, numerically and geographically. You know, now you remember this is, this is a small place compared to the United States. Uh, but Sisters of St. Joseph joined with other religious communities and really, it was the sisters who built up the institutional church of the United States. It was the sisters who really got a school system going. It was the sisters who did hospitals and orphanages. It was the sisters who were available to meet whatever the need was. And the bishops very much needed the sisters and wanted them. And in many cases, wanted to be able to control where they were and maybe more. So as we look at that, we see the distances that our sisters, just, just to give people an idea, Le Puy to Lyon is about 82 miles, but they didn't have a highway. Uh, Lyon to Chambéry, 62. Up to Le Havre was over 400. So that was not a fun trip. Now, let's put ourselves sort of in the general timeline of the area with uh, the next slide. What was going on? Well, in 1847, we had the first foundation of Sisters of St. Joseph in Philadelphia. And we, I think we heard yesterday that at that time, there were only a couple of other religious communities in Philadelphia. Interestingly, the, uh, the uh, Dubuque, uh, the, the, no, the BVM sisters had started in Philadelphia, but things didn't go so well, and they ended up getting their center place in uh, Iowa. In 1847, Brigham Young led his companions to Salt Lake City. In 1847, St. Louis was made an archdiocese. Uh, in 1848, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo completed the process by which half of Mexico became United States territory. 
1849, the Minnesota Territory was created. 1850, California became the 31st state in the Union. Bishop Vincent Whalen became the first Bishop of Wheeling. We'll hear a little more about him. And Jean-Baptiste Lamy was named the Apostolic Administrator of New Mexico, which was a very large territory out that way. So we saw yesterday the beginnings of our time in St. Paul. We can look at that very quickly. The next slide. Uh, we remember that Bishop Creighton asked for help. He offered his palace to the sisters. Mother St. John Fournier, who had founded Philadelphia by 1851, really needed a rest, came here to Crandolet. I, I keep saying here because I'm doing this presentation from St. Louis. And so that's the way my head is working. But Mother Celestine was at Crandolet and was just as worn out as Fournier. And so Fournier offered to go to St. Paul with Sister Frances Joseph Ivory, one of our treasured chroniclers, Sister Philomène Villain, who was one of the original French missionaries, and Sister Scholastica Vasquez, who was called a Creole. Now, when Creighton asked, he had already asked the Visitation Sisters and the BVMs, uh, but they weren't able to give him the sisters that he wanted. So on the next slide, we'll take a quick look and see what their uh, mission was, or what their ministries were. They started uh, the school right away in the Bishop's Palace, as they called it. Then 1853, St. Anthony's School. 1854, there was a cholera epidemic, and uh, the only care available was that uh, offered by the Sisters of St. Joseph. And so that began their hospital ministry. That's often the way we got into ministries across the country. It wasn't that we planned this or looked. It was there was an immediate need, and they did what they needed to do as we saw yesterday with Mother St. John Fournier and her need to deal with the vermin. Uh, by Here's how the hospital grew. They opened their cabin school, and by 1855, they had 10 patients and 30 orphans. In 1853, at the request of Bishop John Newman, who's now St. John Newman, known as St. John Newman, Mother uh, St. John Fournier returned to Philadelphia, where she would remain for the rest of her life. Another development that we don't necessarily know a lot about uh, as U.S. people is Toronto. In 1851, Bishop Charbonnel, the newly named Bishop of Toronto, was in Philadelphia visiting. He was from Lyon originally, and he knew the Fontbonne family. In fact, I think there's some story about his father uh, being a wealthy man, having financed some of Mother St. John's works. But anyway, Sh Bishop Charbonnel asked Sister Delphine Fontbonne, who had come to Philadelphia to help in the novitiate and the hospital, he asked for her to come up to Toronto to found there. So the annals say this clearly. Mother Celestine, who's at Carondelet, sent Delphine from Philadelphia together with Sister Martha Bunning, of whom we will hear more later. Martha Bunning was also from the St. Louis community. We, we, they weren't very well defined yet. But Martha had entered at Crandallet. She had done her novitiate at Crandallet and had been assigned to Philadelphia. Sister Alphonsus Marjorie and Mary Bernard Dinan, who were uh, women who entered the community at Philadelphia. These are the ones that Mother Celestine sent from Philadelphia to Toronto. Uh, and just as a little side note, um, Reverend Jacques Fontban accompanied them, but didn't stay for forever. 
So our next slide will tell us about some of the developments in Toronto. Mother Delphine, as they refer to her, is very, very revered in Canada. And this is a, what they have is her picture from Canada. Uh, they opened the orphanage in 1851. In 1852, Sister Martha Bunning was sent to open an orphanage in Hamilton, also in the, the general area. And she was sent as superior there. Uh, there were two novices by that time received in Toronto, Mary Joseph McDonnell and Mary Frances McCarthy both of whom were born in Ireland. Uh, so we've got the interesting mix. Bunning was German, Fontbonne obviously French, and the two Irish are uh, working together here. Yeah, well, yeah. By 1853, there were three schools under the leadership of the sisters. Now on this next slide, we're going to see our friend, Sister Martha Bunning. Uh, she, as I said, was from Germany, entered the community at Carondelet, then was sent to Toronto. Uh, when she was in Hamilton, when Hamilton became a diocese, and so that community separated from the Toronto community and started their own novitiate. There must have been just a, a crazy amount of vocations in those days, as everybody could think that they could start their own novitiate. Uh, and also perhaps some real um, territorialism, we might say, among the bishops. These are mine, those are yours. Uh, but this is, it's all in this state of growing uh, spontaneously almost. Uh, Sister Teresa Strakoff, Strakoff is sent from Crandolet to become superior in Toronto when Mother Delphine Fontban died. She was, she was tending cholera victims and became a, a victim of cholera. And so they revere her as what they call a martyr of charity. Uh, now Martha Bunning, sweet face. Uh, she was the bishop in 1862, after about six years, deposed her as superior at uh, Hamilton. The reason was they had a school, and the, uh, the, the sisters were in a meeting, and the schoolgirls started to play and got into the sacristy and they were touching the sacred vessels. And Mother Martha Bunning was charged with the responsibility for that sacrilege. The bishop deposed her. I can't remember if he excommunicated her. But she left Canada absolutely brokenhearted and spent some years, uh, I think it was in uh, Buffalo, before she said she had to go back and try to make peace with him. So she went back to make peace with him in 1868. He refused to see her. And she died shortly thereafter, as one of the chroniclers says, of a broken heart. But uh, that's our sister Martha Bunning. It, so let's move on. The next place we're going to go is Wheeling. 1853. The next slide will show us the, uh, I think, pretty handsome Bishop of Wheeling, Richard Whalen. He, he was the Bishop of Richmond, Virginia. Now at this time, Wheeling was part of Virginia. Wheeling didn't become a part, uh, West Virginia didn't separate until 1863. So this was Wheeling, Virginia. And Bishop Whalen was Bishop in Virginia and insisted that there needed to be more than one diocese. So when Wheeling was cut off as a diocese, he also was able to be named the Bishop of Wheeling as opposed to Virginia. Uh, he asked for sisters, and he got uh, Sister Agnes Spencer. Agnes Spencer 
We'll see more about her later, so I won't go into it now. Uh, but Mother Celestine sent Agnes Spencer to Wheeling. Uh, Sister Anastasia O'Brien. Uh, she was born in Kerry, Ireland. She was the infirmarian at Crandallet. And what Bishop Whalen wanted was a hospital. He had been working together with a physician who was willing to offer his home to be a hospital. The physician actually had been working his office out of his home. And so he said the home could be a hospital and he'd like the sisters to take it over. So uh, Anastasia had been the infirmarian at Crandallet and went to Wheeling to work in the hospital where she stayed until uh, 1861 when she returned to Crandallet and apparently returned to being infirmarian. So remember, there wasn't a whole lot of nurses training back in these days and we'll learn more about that particularly as we get into the future of Wheeling and what their service was during the Civil War. Uh, then we have Sister Alexis. Uh, she was born in County Cork. Uh, she probably went to Wheeling as a novice, as a nurse and teacher. Uh, in 1860, she ended up leaving Wheeling for Troy, New York. And she died in what would by then, in 1908, was the New York province. Sister Sebastian, uh, born around 1829, she was received in 1852, uh, probably made her vows at Wheeling, and we don't have a lot more information about her. And then a year later, we can I think go to the next, oh here yes, the next slide. <clears throat> so in 1853 these women come to uh, help out Bishop Whelan. He has worked hard to be ready for them and has arranged for them to, have, to be able to board in a very nice house. The day of the sisters' arrival, the owner of the house finds out that these are not blood sisters but Catholic nuns and she will have none of it. So he quickly has to figure out what to do with them and this is, this is the house that was to be the hospital. And there's an attic up there with two rooms. And that's where the four sisters got their start, uh, being careful to keep their heads down lest they bump them. Um, so that two-room attic was their convent, bedroom, community room, chapel, etc. Now we will go to one of our uh, major figures in the early history of the Sisters of St. Joseph in the United States, Mother Agnes Spencer. Uh, she was born in 1823 in Lancashire, England, and the family emigrated to Utica, New York, which now we hear about as part of uh, the, uh, the Albany province of Grand Uh And then the family came to St. Louis. It, it seems as though the family had some real means, and that comes out later in her story. She received the habit in 1846 at Crandallet. By 1851, she had been sent to Philadelphia to take charge of the orphanage. In 1853, she was appointed superior of the hospital at Wheeling, Virginia. Now, this is how these things go. Think about this. We're thinking this is the founding of the Wheeling community. She goes in 1854. At the end of the year, she goes back uh, to Crandallet. <clears throat> in December, she's going to go and found the community, start a community in Canandaigua, New York, uh, which becomes the Buffalo Rochester communities. Uh, in 1856, she becomes the superior in Buffalo. Uh, in 1860, at the request of Bishop Young of Erie, she took over St. Anne's Academy in Corsica, Pennsylvania, and founded what we would today call the Erie community. Now, as I look at the way these sisters were moving around, uh, 
And I mean, really, this is the next slide, the one that's the succession of, well, see the succession of superiors. They weren't thinking that they were going out to found a congregation of Sisters of St. Joseph, I think. They were opening a mission. And if you open a mission and you're good at it, the next time a mission needs to be open, even within a year, maybe they'll send you to do it. And they did with her, and there's some others who, who had their multiple experiences of opening missions that became uh, congregations. So very quickly, they had the hospital. And now Sister Agnes has returned to Crandallet for a while before she goes to New York. And the next superior was Sister St. Protes, one of the original six uh, who came to the United States and one of our great chroniclers. So the story is that the bishop had these orphan children and he had the sisters take care of the two little sisters. Uh, and the little boy was sent to a foster home. Well, one day, Sister St. Protes and sisters are walking to mass and there's a little boy standing there crying. And she wants to know why he's crying. And he tells her that he lost the money that he was supposed to buy bread with. And he's afraid that if he goes and tells his foster mother this, she'll beat him again. And he wishes he could have such a nice life as his sisters who live with those ladies. So she takes him in. So they get a boy orphan, and it really becomes an official orphanage. Things were growing fast so that by 1856, they were needing a bigger space. And they got chartered for both a hospital and a superior. So here we see our local superiors in this community being founded in Wheeling. Agnes Spencer, 1853. St. Protes, 54 to 55. Agatha Guthrie, of whom we will hear more. Uh, 56 to 58, and another sister, all of these from Carondelet or you know, France, Carondelet. Teresa Struckoff, 58 to 59. In 1854, they had their first novice, uh, Mary Feeney, who became Sister Mary Immaculate. She was sent to do her novitiate at Carondelet. 1856, Eliza Matthews enters the community and she's kept in Wheeling. She's the first postulant to be received there and to receive the habit in Wheeling. Now, we've got Teresa Struckoff from uh, St. Louis as the superior up to 1859. 1860, Mother St. John Fosmas at Crandallet names Mary Stanislaus, this first to be, have her formation in Wheeling, as the superior, and she receives three candidates into the community that year, including one of them being her cousin. Now, I'm saying Mother St. John Fosmas. We'll hear how she got here a little later. But in 1857, Mother Celestine Pomerel at Carondelet died pretty young. Uh, and Mother St. John Fosmas became the superior. There's a lot more to the story, but for the moment. Uh, so Sister Stanislaus came to the meeting to talk about forming a congregation at St. Louis, Crandallet. And uh, while at <coughs> Crandallet, apparently caught a cold and didn't survive the cold. She died in October of 1860, uh, and Bishop Whalen appointed Immaculata Fini as the superior of the small community. Immaculata, well, she'd been around the community for six years, so. Now, it's time to found a new community. Let's take the next one. Canon Dewa, pardon me, you Easterners. I'm from Colorado, and I will learn how to say these words. I'm not sure. But Canandaigua became the community's, was the founding place for Buffalo and Rochester in 1854. 
This gives us a little idea of what all was going on in New York. You know, we had a great amount of growth in the East long before our sisters ventured much in other directions. We did go up to St. Paul in 1851, but it would be 1870 before we made significant trips west. But here's, here's where the sisters were in New York uh, by 1860 or so, and the distance. From St. Louis to Canandaigua was a mere 828 miles. Canandaigua, the next place founded out of there was Buffalo, where the bishop was, and that was 93 miles. Buffalo to Rochester, 75. Canandaigua to Rochester is only 29. But the width of the state here, Buffalo to Brooklyn, which is the beginning point for what's now Brentwood, was nearly 380 miles. Those are significant trips in the mid-1800s. Um, nobody was getting frequent flyer miles. So let's see more about Buffalo here, the next slide. Buffalo was created as a diocese in 1847, taken out of uh, New York the same year that Albany was created. Bishop John Tymon was named the first bishop. He was officially called the visitor of the Vincentians. Visitor basically meant provincial. He was the one who went around and visited all of the communities and kept the men knowing what was going on with all of the men. He had refused an appointment as bishop previously more than once. The first person who wanted him as an auxiliary or a coadjutor was Bishop Rosati. But Timon didn't accept that. Timon was born in the United States. <coughs> he was born in Baltimore in 1797, and he was the third of only 12 children. He studied early on in Baltimore and could very well have been in school with Mother Seton's sons because they were in the same school. He, the family came out to St. Louis as merchants. Uh, in 1822, he started the seminary in St. Louis. In 1823, he joined the Vincentian community, ordained in uh, 1826. Timon, if you don't remember, had accompanied Bishop Rosati to New Orleans for the ordination of Bishop Blanc and was the one with Rosati when the first sisters arrived from Lyon, the first six sisters. So Timon had accompanied these first six sisters up the river uh, when they first arrived to the United States. So Bishop Timon wants some sisters. And of course, he thinks he can call on the Sisters of St. Joseph. So let's go to the next and see about Canandaigua. Now, it's Sister Frances Joseph Ivory who's told the story for us. Uh, the others with her, Mother Agnes Spencer, who had, came to Crondelet from England, was in Philadelphia, wheeling, now is coming as superior in um, Canandaigua. Theodosia Hageman, another German, uh, she'll be around only for a little while. She's one of the very few women who left the congregation. Uh, she, this was after being here and also being part of the founding of Brentwood. Francis Joseph Ivory and Petronella Roscoe. They arrived very significantly for them on the evening before the uh, first celebration of the Immaculate Conception. So if we see the next, I'll tell you some of what Sister Frances Joseph Ivory had to say. They left on St. Louis on December 3rd of 1854. They went by boat to Alton, Illinois, by rail from Alton to Chicago. And she mentions that they stayed with the bishop for the day because he was a friend of Mother Agnes's. They left on December 4th by train and arrived to Buffalo uh, 
December 6th. Now there was too much snow. Uh, so they couldn't, they couldn't continue on to where they were headed. Francis Joseph says, we had a cold, tiresome journey. Uh, it's not the part that I was looking for. Francis Joseph tells us that as they, when they got stopped in Buffalo, they, they knew that they were stuck on, the train was stuck for a number of hours. So they were freezing. They got off and just went looking for where they could get some shelter. Maybe a church, you know, and one of them says, and there was the blessed sign of salvation, the crucifix on top of a, a church. So they went, there was a convent, Sisters of Charity, and lo and behold, isn't one of the Sisters of Charity a, a girlhood friend <coughs> of Sister Francis Joseph Ivory? The two of them grew up together in Pennsylvania. And so they're real impressed with comparing habits. <laughs> they remarked on their clothes. But they, they spent some time there. Uh, the superior there lent them money to help them continue on their way. And it's noted that she was paid back. <laughs> so we don't owe the Sisters of Charity anything for that e evening anyway. Um, she says, we arrived then, finally, the night of December 7th, the eve of the first feast of the Immaculate Conception, when the dogma was proclaimed of faith. We were received very kindly by the good pastor at his own residence as ours was not ready. So many times they got there. I mean, they were even late and it wasn't ready for them. We had a very pleasant house assigned to us in a nice little chapel where he said mass the day we took possession of the house. We opened a boarding school for la young ladies, a day school, the parochial school for boys and girls, also opened a novitiate, the first in the state of New York in 1855. The next year, it, well, then two sisters came, uh, went to, two sisters went to Rochester and opened a parochial school for boys and girls, St. Bridget's. Boys and girls schools were not all that common. Uh, in fact, as I went through the old uh, Catholic directories, you would frequently find that there were more academies for girls kind of high school age than there were boys schools in the Catholic tradition. Why, I'm not exactly sure. Maybe, this, maybe that so many sisters could only teach girls, and there were sisters available for the schools. But uh, by this time, they have got in the community the first sisters who came. Then uh, in 1856, we opened a parochial school in Buffalo. Also commenced the Deaf Mute Institute, for which purpose a large land grant had been offered. This is one of the, the outstanding schools for the deaf in the country, I believe, the Buffalo School. And how did these sisters know how to teach the deaf? You know, our two real prepared sisters, deaf educators, were Celestine Pomerel and St. John Fournier. And they were rather busy being superiors of large communities with novitiates, with hospitals, etc. But uh, so for this uh, school for the deaf, Mother Bernard Tynan came from Toronto. Now maybe she had learned something about deaf education when she entered the community in Philadelphia from Mother St. John Fournier. Uh, Sister Philomène Villain, now she had been at Crandolet. She was one of the original French sisters, so quite likely she had had some sense of deaf education. And Sister Frances Joseph Ivory, who's just good for anything that a good Irish girl can do, I guess. Um, and then she says, after that, Mother St. John Fournier came from Philadelphia. Now see, all of these came from Crandolette to found. Then Mother St. John Fournier came from Philadelphia and brought Sister Veronica Cheers, Sister DeSales Morrissey, and Sister Camilla Phelan. So let's see about these ministries in Buffalo. They said in Buffalo that they were going to offer a fine French education. That was the, those German 
English and Irish sisters <laughs> who were going to do it. Now, granted, some of them had been at Crandallet, so they had been with the original French sisters. And maybe that's how they had the ability to offer a French education. We see here the interesting roles of Mother Celestine and St. John Fournier. And I'm going to comment a little bit more on that in a couple of slides. Uh, but the two of them, sending people. And I think we mentioned yesterday that every indication is that they were great friends. Uh, they were also cousins. And perhaps Fournier had been raised in the Pomerel household. We're not positive about that. But these community members are coming from very different places and different languages. You know, you've got French, German, and English going on here. Their ministries, the boarding school for girls, the parochial school for boys and girls, the novitiate, the buffalo school for the deaf, the male orphan asylum. We can go on to the next. In 1855, they get a couple more sisters from uh, St. Louis. Julia Littenecker, of whom we will hear much more as we go through our history, and Sister Bruno Nolan. They came from Crandallet with Father Paris. Now, if we think about why would that be, it, uh, it's not, not why would a priest accompany them, but Father Paris, when we talked about the f original foundation, Father Paris was the one who opened, who sponsored the opening of the school for freed slaves, for free, free African-American children. And so he had that history with the Sisters of St. Joseph. He also would have been uh, a priest in St. Louis who probably was friends with Bishop Timon. So those are perhaps the reasons that they note that Father Paris came with them. 1856, we have something of great note. The first, the first reception of the habit in the state of New York. Sister Stanislaus Leary. We can go on to the next slide. And Stanislaus is somebody of whom we're going to hear a lot more. She is a wonderful character. She was received, you know, they make a big deal of Sister Stanislaus Leary was the first to receive the habit in New York on the same day in the same ceremony as a Sister Anastasia. But Stanislaus, for some reason, probably, sh you know, first in rank. Anyway, Anastasia wrote her remembrance of this. She says, it was in St. Mary's Church, Canandaigua, that the late Mother Stanislaus and myself were clothed in the garb of the Sisters of St. Joseph on Sunday, the 14th day of February, 1858 by the saintly Bishop Timon. As he was instrumental in having us enter at Canandaigua, he made it a point to come on from Buffalo to invest us with the habit. Now, what's not in this part of the printed letter, one of the pastors in a town nearby thought this was a pretty big deal, that they were having sisters received into the community. And so he told his parish, that they should all come. And so they had a, they, they kind of did a procession or a parade from one town to the next so that all these people could see this marvelous thing of women receiving the habit of the Sisters of St. Joseph. So she says, um, the two prospective nuns proceeded by a procession were a spectacle to angels and to men as they marched around the aisles whilst the sisters in the organ loft rendered sweetly a litany of the Blessed Virgin. Our reception, as far as I know, was the first held in the church. Sister Aloysius Henrik received the habit two months later in the church from the hands of Reverend Edmund O'Connor. You know, kind of a real also ran. Uh, the following year, 1859, is penciled into these uh, annals. Sisters Nativity, Alphonsus, and Nicholas received the habit in the convent chapel. These were the last received in Canandaigua as the novitiate was removed to Buffalo. Now, Stanislaus Leary is going to be a, a very interesting character as she early on becomes the director of the orphanage 
in Rochester. Rochester becomes a diocese. It gets cut off. She's working with Bishop McQuaid. And there's just much more to the story that I won't just know that it's coming and it's a good story. So Stanislaus Leary. Now there's got to be another foundation of all of the photos we have of sisters. <laughs> I think Mother Austin Keene deserves the most sympathy. <laughs> <laughs> she was really a fabulous woman, but this picture I, is there some artist out there who can draw us a good portrait of Austin Keene and some of the others? Uh, Mother Austin Keene came from Pennsylvania. Now, this, she's from the same town as Sister Frances Joseph Ivory. But Ivory entered the community a few years earlier than she did. I, Frances Joseph Ivory entered at Crondelet. Keene enters at Philadelphia. How did these young women from Western Pennsylvania know about the Sisters of St. Joseph? I don't know. Uh, she was baptized by the famous Father Galitzin. Now, when you talk to sisters from Baden, everybody, their, their academy is Mount Galitzin. Uh, Galitzin was a, a Russian prince who converted to Catholicism from Orthodoxy. I believe he was ordained by Bishop John Carroll, the first bishop in the United States, became a missionary, and Mother Austin's extended family, her ancestors, were uh, part of bringing uh, Galitzin out to western Pennsylvania, and he was really the pastor of western Pennsylvania. Uh, very, very famous in his time. They're working on his cause for canonization. Uh, but her family had that relationship with Galitzin. Probably Francis Joseph Ivory was baptized by Galitzin as well. Uh, she, Mother Austin Keene entered the community in Philadelphia in 1849, which means that in her formation, she was in touch with Mother St. John Fournier, and with Delphine Fontbonne. So she's got that real touch of the old French, although her family has long roots in the United States. They've been in western Pennsylvania for generations. One, you know, one of her ancestors fought in the Revolution and all of that. Uh, in 1856, she was received in 49. In 56, she founds Brentwood. She founded Baden in 69 and Rutland in 73. Uh, now, is this next slide? In the meantime, we've gotten new missionaries from France. This is something that many sisters of St. Joseph, and I think particular Crandolette, are not very aware of. When we talk about the sisters who came from France, we talk about the first six maybe eight, who came from Lyon in 1836 and 1837. Starting in 1854, the little community of Moutier, which was a foundation out of the congregation of Chambéry, which was a foundation from Lyon. So you see how this is Lyon, Chambéry, Moutier. Moutier sent the first four missionaries of the 39 they would end up sending to the United States. Now this beginning had to do primarily with Bishop Miege, who was the bishop, uh, he was the apostolic vicar, I believe was the correct title, of Kansas. Miege was from that area, from the Moutier area of France. So he knew the Sisters of St. Joseph, and these, these bishops, the, the French ones, anyway, were always, not always, but were frequently going back to France looking for money from the propagation of faith, looking for personnel, priests and sisters. And so Miege knew the Sisters of St. Joseph, asked them to come. In this first group of four, one of them was named Sister Mary St. John Phasmas. So Phasmas arrives and 
uh, the story is there in the, in the Heritage Hall at Carondelet. It says when she gets to, to the United States, well, first of all, Bishop Miege was not in St. Louis, didn't come to St. Louis, nor was there one of, uh, did he send a delegate for these sisters. So they were with the Carondelet sisters. And she presents herself to Mother Celestine, saying that she's from the mountains. Beautiful area, Moutier. And she's very good at herding cattle. So, you know, humble. And what does Mother St. John, I mean, Mother Celestine do? Puts her in charge of the novitiate. <laughs> So Mother St. John Fosmas really became, uh, I think, Mother Celestine's right arm. We'll hear more about that story as time goes on. But just getting back to the foundation of um, Brentwood, the next slide, please. It's actually Brooklyn at the time. Bishop Laughlin is the first bishop of Brooklyn. Brooklyn happens to have the fame of being at least the first if not the only diocese in the United States that's totally urban. It's city. There's no outside, no suburb, it's city. But <clears throat> the Brooklyn Diocese needs sisters. Laughlin asks Mother St. John Fournier. By now, Bishop Kenrick has moved on to Baltimore. He is the Archbishop of Baltimore, which is really the number one C in the United States, the number one archdiocese. And in his place is Bishop John Newman, uh, now known as St. John Newman. He was a redemptorist. This must have be a, a photo or a, a portrait by someone very, very kind. <laughs> uh, poor Mother Austin <laughs> described Bishop Newman as the ugliest God, man God made, but also the holiest. <laughs> so that's, that's really not such a bad picture <laughs> if you've got that description. Anyway, when New, uh, Sister Mother St. John Fournier speaks to Bishop Newman, he says, we can't afford to send sisters to New York. You gotta tell him no. Well, Laughlin is also friends with Timon. Laughlin's in, in Brooklyn, Timon's in Buffalo. And how it happened, I'm not sure, but Laughlin writes and said, could you send me the very least number of sisters? So from Philadelphia, the very least number goes, Mother Austin. But Bishop Timon sends two others over. Uh, so they can't, he wants, he says no, she says, I'll go wherever, and that's kind of what she did, was go wherever. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. We've got Brentwood. Uh, this is from the Rochester Annals. The Sisters of St. Joseph had been called in 1856 to take charge of the Catholic schools in Brooklyn. It sounds like a rather <laughs> large task for three. <laughs> At the request of Right Reverend John Laughlin, the first bishop of that place, so great was the pressure of work assigned them that the number of sisters was inadequate to the demand. About this time, what a wonderful phrase, a change of air was necessary for Sister Stanislaus. So Stanislaus, the first received in New York in Buffalo, goes over to help out where her good friend, Sister Baptista Hansen, who was part of Buffalo, came from Philadelphia, part of Buffalo, but was sent to help found Brooklyn. She's there. So and following Bishop Timon's advice, Mother Agnes Spencer sent Stanislaus Leary to New York to the loving care of Sister Baptista Hansen, and she passed two years of her novitiate there. So this leads us to a qu question. The next slide, please. Has they said to Jesus, by whose authority? Who is sending these people, and, and who gives them, who, who's in charge here? Bishop Newman told Mother St. John they didn't have enough sisters. 
Timon sent two from Buffalo. The two who went from Buffalo were originally sent by Celestine from Carondelet. Okay? Uh, then Mother St. John Fournier sends Mother Austin Keen. Um, there's, there's some close relationship going on here between Buffalo and Brooklyn. Uh, and who's sending whom? And how are, they, how are they figuring out their organization? Who, where do you belong? You know, are you opening a mission or are you founding a congregation? That's the way these things were all growing at that time. Uh, so they start in Brooklyn. And the next slide. If you want to know why Mother Austin looked like that, it would not take long to give here an inventory of the house as four beds, a few chairs, one table, and a scarcity of utensils were all it contained. The only light they had was a candle placed on a bottle found in the cellar, and their first meals were bought with the few coins left over from their traveling expenses. The beginnings were hard just about everywhere. And we don't have a lot of time left, but let's go on and see if we can get ourselves founded in New Albany. Says uh, Sister Frances Joseph Ivory, the Oswego mi Mission was opened from St. Louis about 1857. Now, doesn't it make sense that if there's a community in Philadelphia and a community in Buffalo and a community in Brooklyn, St. Louis should found in Oswego? <laughs> anyway, uh, Mother Stanislaus Saul, Sister Patricia Pine, and Sister Hyacinth Blanc. Hyacinth Blanc was one of the Moutier sisters, along with others, answered the call of Father Gaudet, Gaudet, Gaudet. This is the first colony for the Diocese of Albany, she says, around 1860. Uh, these sisters, as did uh, St. No, John Fournier, writing in yesterday's piece, said, well, I'm not sure the date, but they must have it at Crandallette. Now, just a note on Crandallette. I've, Sister Jane Bellman and I have had discussions about there's no, why can't we find any evidence of this or that? But we remember there was a fire at Crandallet. And we may have lost some very important letters, evidence, pieces of things in that fire. We nearly lost Mother St. John Fasmas, but they came and helped her out of a second story window. She wasn't feeling well that day to begin with. <laughs> but uh, the story on this is kind of fun. The, this pastor, wanted Sisters of St. Joseph. And he's turning to Carondelet. And before he gets a yes, he buys the land. Before he gets a yes, he, buys, he builds a convent. Before he gets a yes, he furnishes the place. Maybe that was our problem. We were so used to going where the, nothing was ready that <laughs> we didn't know what to do with that. But anyway, by 1858, there were about 150 members of the Carondelet congregation. That's women received at Crandallet, uh or by then uh, St. Paul as well. But that's, that's a pretty significant growth in 20 years uh, for the population that there was. So Mother St. John Fosmas, who's now taken over from Mother Celestine, sends four young missionaries. Uh, and within a year, this is sort of the makeup of the community. Stanislaus Saul, born in Germany. Patricia Pine, born in Ireland. Flavia Waldron, born in Ireland. Chrysostom McCann, born in the U.S. Eusebius Verina, born in the U.S. Hyacinth Blanc, Blanc from Moutier. So this is how this community is growing and spreading as we're moving toward the, you know, 1860, just before the time of the Civil War, uh, and Mother Celestine is going around visiting all of these communities like a superior general would, but they don't have this organization yet. They're, they're figuring it out, but they're beginning to talk about becoming 
uh, one congregation with provinces because of their spread. Now we can look at their spread in this next slide. This is where major foundations had been made. Natchez, Mississippi, if that star stayed where it was supposed to, was founded by Bourg in the early 1850s. So that, was, that didn't come from this Crondelet Center. The two big stars are St. Louis and Philadelphia. And then we've got St. Paul and all of those New York places. This is by 1860. Uh, well, we've also got Wheeling, Virginia. Uh, and Erie, Pennsylvania it is founded in 1860. We didn't talk about that yet, but it comes in by then. So how are these sisters related to one another? Who, by whose authority? Who's in charge? They're trying to figure it out. And that's where we come to the end of this second part with that final slide, looking at those who were our ancestors. And it's kind of fun, I think, to have this one sister whose photo we don't have. But she reminds us that she's kind of the every sister of the group. So that's up to almost what has happened by 1860. And thank you very much for being here, for tuning in, for paying attention. We'll see what happens next.